Thank you for tuning in to Upon the Rock broadcast. I'm your host, Pastor Lawrence Shakir. I believe the Word of God will build a godly foundation in the lives of people. There is more available information on our website. You can log on to ShakirMinistries.org. Now, let's go on to today's message. Building back the families. Go to my next point, please. And it's dealing with what? Obviously the family. But why do we say building back the families? It's broken. How many of us have ever seen broken families? All of us, right? All of us have seen, you know, times where we wish. I mean, and I was just telling Ms. Shannon this morning that our parents did the best they can to raise us, right? And so you don't fault your parents, but sometimes you can grow up to a point where you missed out on certain things and you wish you had it. Uh, you know, right now I'm, a, I'm, I'm real self-motivated, but when I was a child, I, was, I had a lot of low confidence. I was very quiet, very shy, and I didn't have a, a lot of people pushing me, telling me I can do a lot of good things. Only when I got older and I started realizing that if I don't aim at something that I'm not going to hit it, that's when I start to get self-motivated, you know, but children are like arrows. Sometimes you got to tell them where they're going. You got to point them in a direction and then encourage them. Even if you don't physically see it yourself, you got to be that way to kind of like encourage them so they can get there to areas that you can't get to. And so one of the things that I like to do is tell my kids who they are. Like I told you all last week, tell them, you know, that you're not like every average kid at your school. Some of them kids, they be saying they be cussing and doing this and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And we sit down with them the best we can to talk to them about this. And I'm not trying to put my kids on blast or anything. I, I try not to do that, but I'm just trying to show an example of sometimes you got to tell these kids that because if they don't hear it from you, then they're not going to hear it. And I talked to y'all last week about how it's important for the men, because God has called us to be the head, that we be the ones who speak that into, into the next generation. Now, the women are holding it down. Thank God for the women. But God has, yeah, amen to that, you know. <laughs> but God has uh, supernaturally placed a degree of strength inside of men for, a time, for this time so that we can, you know, point our families in the right direction. And so, of course, when we start something like this, when it comes to the family, it's very, very important for the, women, for the men to really get involved when it comes to this because we are the quote unquote shot callers of the house according to God's standards, okay? And, um, and you all are growing up and everything and DJ's getting older. It's one of those things that God needs to have us to start looking in a certain direction if we plan on having successful families. Now, how many of y'all want successful families? I mean, nobody wants a broken family. Nobody wants to start something, have a beautiful marriage and then see that thing end in divorce or see the kids you know, hating their parents or hating their dad or hating their mom or all that kind of stuff. So if if much as possible, we need to try to build back the walls of this family. OK, because kids grow up and they uh, they hold in resentment that they don't tell you when they're kids. Only when they get out the house, they start telling you how much this hurt them or you didn't do this. And you don't want to live a life of regret. So our job is to make sure that we build back as many of these gaps in this wall as we possibly can. Now there's gonna be some gaps, but you gotta make sure you don't neglect these gaps, okay? And I know some of you all haven't started your family yet, like Ellison's, but one day you will. And so you have to kind of set the standard now and start moving in that direction so God can bless your family, all right? So um, everybody say building back the family. One more time, building back the family. All right, so the, the first point I went to, you can go to that. Uh, the scripture I told you all is, a good man leaves an inheritance. Everybody say inheritance. inheritance. So the Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children or his grandchildren or well, like we talked about last week, he leaves an inheritance to his generation, right? Now it says a good man does this. That word man is implied because it was, it was added by the translator, but it's actually talking about a good person will leave an inheritance to his children's children. In other words, you don't just focus on your time now. You don't just focus on what you're doing. You know, it's good for, for me to have this, but, you know, tough to be my kids. No, you can't do that. The Bible talks about a good person will leave an inheritance to his children's children. In other words, you've got to pass down something 
more than just money and provision, right? Because we know to go to work, pay the bills, put food on the table, put clothes on their back, and we can say, well, I've done my duty. No, that's your reasonable service according to Romans chapter 12. But a good man, which is a lot of people not a good man or good person, will leave an inheritance. You gotta leave a spiritual inheritance inside of your kids, inside of your generation inside of those who look up to you. And the Bible says this is the kind of person that will leave something behind. Not only just money, thank God for that. Not only just aiming in the right direction, go to college and go to school, get a good job, that's great. But you gotta leave some spiritual inheritance inside of them. So by the time they grow up and get out of your house, they know how to pray. They know how to fast. They know how to give. They know how to, you know, they, they have a relationship with God instead of just coming in your house seeing that you pray a little bit or you you know listen to some christian music or whatever but then when they walk out they, they have no they have no relationship with him y'all get what i'm trying to say so we have an obligation to pass something down to the next generation but not to our kids but to our grandkids yeah these boys are living in my house but i'm trying to put something inside of them that's going to affect the generation of shakir's that's going to come after them and so we have to do our part to make sure that we're a good man or a good woman I said last week about how the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. If you don't do this, you're going to end up raising a generation who's going to work for somebody who will do this. So in other words, God's going to get this word accomplished. Either you're going to be on the receiving end of this family thing, or you're going to be on the other end helping another family be the blessing, and you're just living under the curse. Y'all get it? It's all up to the, us, though. We can't just think that an inheritance is going to drop on us. We are the righteousness of God. Thank God for that. But those are more spiritual blessings. But I'm talking about some of the stuff in your generational bloodline. You can have the successful family that you dream about. You don't have to have a broken family if you don't want to. Y'all hear me? Just because it looks bad now does not mean you have to accept it. Just because things are not working the way you like them to work and you, you had this idea about family and you're praying about this, but when you open your eyes, you see uh, arguments and hate and, and animosity and tension. That doesn't mean you have to accept it. It may, not, it may be something that you're probably your parents passed down. You saw them argue. You saw them fight. You saw them get divorced. And then if, you don't, if you're not careful, you start thinking, well, that's what's going to happen to me too. But if you think that way, you're going to move in that direction. Y'all get it? So sometimes you got to renew your mind. If you know that that is a trend in your family and you are on that path, then you got to do some stuff to ensure that that doesn't happen to you. So that you got to be the, that good man that leads an inheritance. Install that prayer time in your family. Y'all hear what I'm trying to say? Yeah. You got to install Bible study. You got to install spiritual inheritance so that so these kids, when they grow up, they have something. They have substance. They got faith. It's good to take them to church, but don't just take them to church and then just leave church at church. You got to bring that at home because that's what's a, what they're going to learn. They're not going to so much listen to what you say. They're going to look at what you do. I told you about how most things when it comes to children, things are caught more than taught. So you can say, oh, yeah, do what I say, but don't do what I do. That ain't no, that ain't no good example. You know, y'all heard that before, right? Do what I say, don't do what I do. And see, that, that kind of stuff right there is what, what got us in, a, in this mess in the first place. So sometimes you got to do it. You tell them to do what you say, but you got to also do what you do, too. If, if you tell them of them, yeah, go to church and pray. They need to see you going to church and praying. Yes. That's, that's the kind of stuff. That's how you pass things down. Next point, please. I like this scripture right here. And I told you this is these two are the main memory verses for this entire series. You must commit yourself. Everybody say commit. commit. You must commit yourselves. In other words, you can't just say that was a good sermon. That's a good topic. I like that. I think I'm going to get the CD over there. And you can't just do that. If you don't commit yourself to this, you will not have that inheritance. I don't care how much you like teachings like this. If you never commit, all that stuff is going to be stored up for someone who will commit. So he said commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commandments that I am giving you today. Everybody say today. today. The Bible said the day you hear my voice, what? Harden not your heart. In other words, if the word of God is coming to you today and you understand it today and the seed is planted in you today, you have to commit yourself to this if you want to see that kind of fruit. So it says today you got to commit wholeheartedly to these commandments. 
Then he says, repeat them again and again. And I, I like how he keeps saying again. In other words, he's trying to overemphasize, repeat them again to your who? Children. You got to rep- repeat this kind of stuff that we're talking about right now. Clock it in time with God. You got to repeat this when you're sitting at home with your kids or your generation or your nephew, whoever, did, whoever. See, you know, sometimes you don't have to be a parent to pass an inheritance down. You can pass an inheritance down to your family members, to your somebody who you're mentoring or the next generation who probably doesn't have a, a, a solid family figure. You can be that gap and you can pass something down and they will grow up and say, you know what? If this person hadn't came in my life, I would have never got this spiritual inheritance. You can be that person. But if you're a parent, obviously your first priority is to your to your bloodline. Repeat them again and again to your children or repeat them to the next generation. Talk about them when you're at home, not just at church, at home. Open up the Bible, cl- turn off the TV, turn off the phones and turn off the games and talk about them with your children at home. Y'all get it? Over and over again, he says, talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road, when you're driving, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Yes, to be that example, sometimes you got once you first wake up in the morning, you open your Bible or you listen to your Bible. You you start the day off and you you acknowledge God in all your ways first until you tell me, get up, it's time to get up and y'all get up. No, no. Before y'all do that, somebody needs to have some type of little even if it's five minute devotion. <laughs> I'm guilty of it. <laughs> get out, get out of this bed. You know, it's time to go. But sometimes you got to just stop. And then just before you go in there and, and start your day or put on your clothes and do all that stuff, open the Bible, read you a few scriptures or something and get in the word a little bit. Give God his first portion of the day. Then you start your day. Tie them around your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Some things you just have to have visual. I told you all last week, you got to have a visual thing. Sometimes you got to post scriptures up in your walls, in your house, you know, put things in, in, in the music. When you wake up, turn on the you know, gospel music or whatever it is. But you got to put things in front of your ears and your eyes. Write them down on your doorposts of your house and at your gates. When you leave out and everything, have the word of God there. That's not being fanatical. It's not being fanatical. It's being committed wholeheartedly. That's what it's talking about. But some people say, does it really take all that? If you want to have a successful family, it does take all that. If you don't want a successful family, then don't do anything then. And just let the world just do what it's going to do. And then you will see how that attack on families is destroying it. I mean, uh, there are some statistics out there about how, you know, 75% 75% of kids today are raised in these single parent or these broken families and everything. And nobody has really seen a real strong substance of a, of a real family. So that means as a body of Christ, if you know that as the world system, and then you're not under that kind of covering, then by default, that thing is going to try to visit your house. Now, you may be happy now and everything is good, but if you don't try to take some commitment to whatever you're trying to do, Sooner or later, that spirit will start knocking on your door and it will try to break up your house. And y'all loving each other now and everything is fine. But sooner or later, if nobody commits himself, like this word says, then you'll be just another statistic, another broken family. Verse 10, this is where we pick up right here. Go to my next point, please. Point number six is beware of becoming weary. Look at that cute dog down there. He's just weary and tired. But a lot of us is like that. You've been fighting all day or like this soldier right here. You got all the armor on. You got everything ready to kill the enemy, but you got too much pressure on you. Or you're like this person. You just hang it on until until you can hang on anymore. But you got to just look at sometimes that you can face a situation and it's been going that way for a long time. And you're like, Lord, will I ever get out of this? And you got to be careful that you don't become weary because if the enemy can't attack you from the outside, he will attack you from the inside. So what does it say? Verse 10. Meanwhile, the people of Judah said the strength of the laborers are giving out. And there's so much rubble that we can't build the wall ourselves. There's so much so much stuff going on that the the discouragement is coming in and says we got too much to do. I don't know if we can really make this thing work. The strength of the laborers are giving out now. First, I was strong. I was motivated. Yes, let's build the family. But we're three months into this thing and it's still nothing changed. What do you do when discouragement comes knocking on your door? 
Because you got to remind yourself who, got, even, with, even with David, when they took his family and, and they burned Ziklag, the Bible says that everybody wants to stone David, but David encouraged himself. And a lot of times when you look around in your house and you see that everything's going crazy and, and you had this plan and you had this purpose and you tried to play, pray on it and still nothing changed, you got to be that person that just says, I don't care what happens, I'm going to keep on moving forward. And when you get to that point and you break past that, that's when you start seeing that kind of manifestation because God wants to see how far will you stretch to. Are you going to break under pressure or are you going to still just, OK, Lord, though you slay me, I'm still going to trust you. You got to be that kind of person that I don't care what it takes. I'm going to commit myself wholeheartedly, even if this kills me. Oh, Lord, I don't want to go that far. Well, then you don't want what God is trying to promise you. Some things you got to be willing to lay down for because weariness is going to come in. When the going gets tough, a lot of people just quit. This is too hard. I don't feel like doing this anymore. It was great when I heard it the first time, but ain't nothing changing. I might as well just give up. You got to tell yourself, what am I going to do? Am I going to be weary in well-doing? Uh-oh, my fault. That's me. I can, I can fix that. There we go. All right. So verse 10, meanwhile, the people said the strength of the laborers is given out. There's so much rubble we cannot build. Verse 11, the, also our enemy said before they, before they see it and know it, we will be right there among them and we will kill them and put an end to this family. The enemy is saying, I'm depending on you being weary during this time. And once I see you're weary, I'm going to jump on the bandwagon and say, before you know it, I'm going to be right back in your house and it's going to be worse. See, he got that. The voice of the enemy is saying it's going to be worse because you start this thing. And now that you're weary, when I come in, I'm going to make sure you never rise again. You got to you got to look at what you're looking at, because the enemy is waiting outside just to see who's going to give up first. Who's going to blink first? And you got to stand toe to toe with him and says, I bet you ain't coming up in here. You got to draw a bloodline around your house. Anoint your house. Pray. You got to get everybody on one accord because the Bible talks about that Jesus sent his disciples two by twos. But why two by twos? Because he knows that weariness is going to come. But when that person falls, the other one can catch him up. So you got to get family involved. Again, you can't always be the strongest, spirit, most spiritual person in your house. It's good for a season, but you got to raise up everybody else to kind of help you see what you're doing so you can bear this load. What verse was that? 11? Mm -hmm. Also, our enemy said before they see it or know it, we will be right there among them and kill them and put an end to this work, put an end to this family, put an end to this dream. Verse 12. Then the Jews who live near came and told us 10 times over. Wherever you turn, they will attack us. Look at that verse. The people that's living in your own house. Is now probably saying, I don't know if this is going to work. It seems good, but we're getting attacked on every single area, all because you made a decision that you want to build back this family. So what are you, you going to do when you see that kind of stuff happening? When they tell you over and over and over again, so you already got the weariness that's, that's unspoken inside of you. Then you get the weariness outside from the enemy. Then you got the verbal stuff from the inside of the house saying it's not going to work. And you got to cast down all those imaginations if you plan on being a serious family member or building a serious, serious family. All right. So watch this. Uh, Therefore, I stationed behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places. In other words, I, as I looked at the house and I see this is where the enemy attacks us most. We always arguing on this issue. That's where I put the guard at. Where I see that this is where me and this. Uh, me and this kid keep bumping heads at or whatever. That's why I put the guard at. Y'all understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. God is saying that you got to be wise when it comes to the enemy's attacks. If you see that it's a pattern, that your family keeps going through this certain thing, somebody got to say, I'm going to post a guard in these weak points. I hope y'all hear me. All right, so watch this. I think I'm on the next point here. Uh, yeah, here, no, not, not yet, not yet, almost there. After I, verse 14, after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers or your family, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your homes. In other words, you got to get to the point where you remember who you really are. Y'all remember uh, how uh, was that? Well, in fact, I got the next I got the point here. I don't know if I'm going to do it yet. But a lot of times when you start doing something for God, you forget the promise. 
you forget what's down the line. You forget what you're really fighting for. So point number two is remember who you are. A lot of times you probably had a good example. You probably came from a good household. They thank God they took you to church. They tried to put something in you and then you kind of go away and you start your own family. And you're like, man, where was Big Ma at, at this time? I mean, if, if she was around or grandpa was around, this kind of stuff wouldn't be happening to the family. Well, guess what? They live in you. Your father, your heavenly father, lives in you. The same ability that was in your Big Ma, Medea or whoever, lives inside of you. And you can build back the family just like how they build back the family. Some of them are already dead and gone. And you can't do anything about it except for just have a memory of how it used to be when you was growing up. You know, my wife tell me that in her grandma's house, Medea, they prayed all the time. Nobody was, I mean, it was no cussing in there. It was a sanctified church, sanctified house, you know. People didn't want to come over there because they knew there was going to be some praying going on. <laughs> but they'd come over there to eat, though. But my point is, Medea's gone. Somebody got to pick up that mantle somewhere. Y'all see what I'm saying? And Medea lives in all of her kids. She passed it down. But a lot of times we grow up, we have these families, and we forget who we are, that we're the, we're the real king, basically, for this, for this family. And so we live in an area where we think, ah, Akuna Matara ain't nothing happening, it's fine. But you don't realize you're supposed to be ruling over something. Y'all get what I'm saying? And so a lot of people, they kind of just settle by trying to just do the best they can, not realizing they got all these spiritual inheritance inside of their bloodline. You're more powerful than you think you are. But the world didn't tell you that. The world says, well, just get married and have kids and just go to work and feed them. No, you can pass things down. And if you're going to have a successful family, you got to remember who you are. So that's what he says right here in verse um, 14. He says, after I looked things over, so I stood up and said, remember the Lord who is great and awesome, he will fight for your and fight for your brothers, fight for your sons, fight for your daughters, fight for your wives, fight for your homes. Verse 15. Somebody read verse 15, please. When our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to our work on the wall. All right. Read it one more time, Marcus, please. When our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to our work on the wall. All right. So when, God, when the enemies heard that we were aware of their plot, in other words, you just exposed the enemy. You got done, you start seeing all these weak points, but when the enemy realized, oh my goodness, they know this is where we keep coming in. The Bible says that they, they, uh, the enemies heard and they were aware of God's plots and it was frustrated. So then what did they do? Did they rejoice because they rebuked the enemy? No, they went back and returned to the wall. They went back and started rebuilding the family again. So in other words, you may get victory in these certain areas, but don't shout too long. Keep on building the family because you know he's going to come back again, right? All right. From that day on. OK, go to my next point, please. From that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears and and bows and armor. In other words, they start to develop a plan of attack. Once you see what the enemy is doing, you see that he came in at these weak points. You rebuked him out. Put something together to fill that that void back. All right. You got to get to the point, and I like how it says this, from that day on, half my men did the work while the other halves were equipped with spears, swords, and shields, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people. Notice how it says they posted behind the people. In other words, you need some kind of covering. That's what he's talking about being behind. Some people are going to need to be covered more than others because you may be a little more spiritual or more, more sound in that one. But somebody, and usually it should be the man of the house. If it's not a man, then the, the, the next spiritual leader, obviously the, the mom, the wife. If you are of Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and your heirs according to the promise, which means you have authority in your house. And if somebody is not a believer or somebody is not on that level, then you can take on that level for that season. It's OK. But you got but somebody got to do something then. All right. So he says we built back those walls. Verse 18. Each man held his weapon in his hand, held a weapon in the other. I'm sorry, each of the builders who wore a sword at his side, he worked, but the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. In other words, I'm going to read 17 and 18 again. Who were building the wall, those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in another. And each builder wore a sword at his side as he worked, but the man with the trumpet 
stayed with me. In other words, everybody was working, but they had a weapon in their hands too. What does the sword represent in Ephesians? The word of God. Y'all good. Y'all a little sleepy today, but it's okay. <laughs> but the Bible talks about that everybody needs to have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Whether it's the little babies, even the little babies got a little dagger. Pull them out, talking about jump if you want to, see what happens. <laughs> but you need, you got to have the little kids with their daggers too, along with the parents with the sword. But the point of the matter of that story is that they were working with one hand, chiseling something, but they had their sword in the other hand and they were still watching and seeing the enemy. So you keep building, but at the same time you keep watching. But then he said, the man with the trumpet stayed with me. In other words, we have to develop a plan that when the enemy roars, we all come together in one place. So when there's an attack on the family, let's all turn off the music and let's turn on worship. We're all gonna pray. We're all gonna meet. We're all gonna do this. We're gonna fast. We're gonna talk. We're gonna do, but somebody gotta say that kind of stuff. Don't expect this kind of plan to just fall into place. Somebody gotta call some shots and say, this is how we're gonna beat this enemy. Y'all hear me? Yes. I know y'all hear me. You know I just say that every time I just teach every now and then. I just, Y'all hear what I'm saying? Y'all hear what I'm saying? Y'all hear me? Of course you can't. You got no choice. All right. Verse 21. So he says, verse 20, he says, wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there and our God will fight for us. Whenever you get to the point where everybody's doing everything in the house and we all don't come together, we got to get to the point where the whole family does pray together again. Too many of us go to our different rooms. We all got our own little stuff going on. I'm guilty of it, too. But we got to get to the point where we all come together on one accord and say, let's pray you all. It's time to pray. We gotta worship. Soaking, let's soak up this worship or whatever. But don't just go to school, go to work, bring home a paycheck, next day repeat it all over again. Sometimes you gotta stop what you're doing and say the enemy is coming in, so we gotta, we gotta congregate together. Y'all get it? All right, so we continue to work, have holding spears. I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit. He says that we we done this so much until the, the breaking of the day, until the stars came out at night. And a lot of times people need to realize that it's a, it got to be a, a daily thing, not just on Sunday. But when you leave this place and when you go Monday, Tuesday, and when life starts happening, you got to bring this kind of stuff in the, in the house. All right. Because kids are at school. You don't know who, what's happening over there. You're at work, you're just, you know, busy about your stuff. You need to make sure that everybody is still covered, you know, all the members of that household, all right? Okay, all right, so what I'm gonna do now, go to my next point, please. Number nine, I'm almost there. Hear the outcry. Somebody, I know you're gonna read already, Marcus, but that's okay, but I want somebody else to read verse, chapter nine, chapter five, verse uh, one, two, and three. Anybody? Mm -hmm. They were saying, we have such large families, we need more food to survive. Mm -hmm. Others said, we have mortgaged our fields, vineyards, and homes to get food during the famine. Mm -hmm. Verse 4, 2, and 5, please. Verse 4, 5, okay. Yes. And others said, we have had to borrow money on the fields and vineyards to pay our taxes. We belong to the same family as those who were wealthy, and our children are just like theirs. Yet we must sell our children into slavery just to get enough money to live. We have already sold some of our daughters and we are helpless to do anything about it. For our fields and vineyards are already mortgaged to others. Verse 6 is the last one. Read that, please. When I heard their complaints, I was very angry. Very good. Let's read that again, verse 6. When I heard their complaints, I was very angry. All right, so in other words, you got to hear the outcry. You got to get to the point when, when it comes to building a family, and I can just see this in my mind, put everybody at the table somewhere and let them all vent. You let them get to the point and say, you know, mom, you get on my nerves because of this or whatever. <laughs> I mean, don't be talk, threatening with a belt, talking about stay in a child's place, don't do that. Sometimes you, gotta, sometimes you gotta let them talk. If they're fighting against each other, let them vent against each other, let them complain, and you sit there and hear the outcry. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, Miss Andrew. <laughs> but in other words, you gotta create a space for them to feel free to express themselves. But then he says, when I heard their complaints, I was very angry, but he didn't just react by blowing up. The next verse says that he pondered first, and then he says, we need to do something about this. Every now and then, once you get everybody 
to the point where they all vented out and dad, I don't like when you do this or mom, I don't like when you do this. And my sister, I don't like when they, and everybody thinks she's the favorite one and us and such and she get on my nerve or whatever that kind of stuff is. You need to let all that kind of stuff out. And then there will come a point right here where it says right here that um, their outcry and then he, he exposed them. But I want to, I'm going to move down to verse. I'm going to move down to verse eight. And I said, what's your, uh, in fact, he says, and he said, as far as possible, we have brought back our Jewish brothers and sold them from, from the Gentiles. Now you are selling your, your brothers only to be sold back to us. Sorry to skip over so much. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. They kept quiet because they found nothing to say. After you let people vent their frustration, there will come a time where people will stop talking and they will, they'll begin to listen. But nobody's going to be listening while everybody's hollering and arguing with each other. You got to have a structured place to let them argue. But then when the arguing is done and all the ventilation is, is, is out, there will come a time where people are ready to listen. But they won't listen to you if you're not a good example. In other words, if you want those kind of parents to say, do what I do, do what I say, but don't do what I do. When it comes time for them to listen, they're not going to listen to you. Sometimes you got to prove yourself. Even if that takes a while, you got to tell you got to you got to prove yourself that, you know, you are a good example that you really want to build this family. You hear what I'm trying to say? So don't just tell them that this is what we're going to do. Sometimes they need to see how serious it is in your eyes first. And then you will get to a point where the family will be just like this. And that's what you want. You want people to be willing to listen, not to just outcry. It's good to outcry. But you want to the point where they start to listen. And the Bible says that Nehemiah rebuked them for doing their, you know, bad stuff or whatever. But then it got to the point where they kept quiet because they had nothing else to say. And when you when you get to that point in your family, then you start telling people, OK, this is how we should put things together then. All right. Next point. And don't be a burden. This is my last one. And I'm um, and I'm just about done. And I'm going to just read this uh, to them. He told them to give them, give them back their fields and vineyards. They agreed to do so. Um, I had some notes that I had to read. I can't believe I've just been flowing this whole time. Oh, OK, OK, OK. I said everything. All right. All right. Somebody read um, where Nehemiah chapter 5. Read 14, 15 and 16, please. Artaxerxes. Please, I'm sorry. I worked on the I worked on the wall so that all my men who were gathered there, we did not buy any bills. All right, let's go right there. One thing about Nehemiah that I love is Nehemiah was a governor, but he was also a servant. He was a cupbearer. You know what a cupbearer is at that time? Somebody who just tastes the wine for the king to make sure there's no poison in it, and then he give it to him. He just had a regular nine to five job. He wasn't some descendant of a king. He wasn't somebody real popular. He was just a regular guy that was a cupbearer. And then he got thrown into a governor's seat. And a lot of times that's how it is when it comes to the family, that you're just a regular person trying to do what God calls you to do. And God throws you in this seat of authority. And you're like, I don't even know if I can do this. But if you can just like he's, like she just read right there, the other governors before him, you know, they was demanding all of this food and wine and all of this money and all this attention. But he wasn't like that. Sometimes you got to be the kind of person, if you're going to be a good example, you got to be strong at what you're doing. But you also got to be humble enough to get down with everybody else. So don't use your role as y'all better listen to what I got to say, but use your role as an influence to help everybody do it. OK, what am I saying? I'm the head of the house, but that doesn't mean that I can just do whatever I want because I'm the head of the house. Sometimes if I'm telling my boys to do something, then I got to do it, too. You know, my wife says, go and clean the bathroom. I ain't like, mm, who do you think you're talking to? No, I go and clean the bathroom. 
It may not be according to her specifications. <laughs> but I clean it, though, because, you know, if it's, my day, if it's my day to cook, I'm always late on it. I'm guilty of it. But I'm cooking, though. My point is, you can't use your role in saying, mm, y'all need to do this because I'm the one in charge. Sometimes the higher you go, the more humble you ought to be. And you got to get to the point where if you're going to effectively lead somebody, they need, to, they need to see, are you worth getting behind? Why should I listen to you in the first place? Because you're the dad or you're the parent? So what? You got to show them, like the governor was here, he said, I could have gotten all this other stuff, but I didn't want to do that. I want to make my own way. So in other words, he also said that me and my officials worked on the wall. He wasn't just a shot caller. He took his governor clothes and was picking up bricks. He took his governor clothes and started chiseling out things. So in other words, you have to be in the fight with everybody else. And don't think you're so important because you are the person in charge of the house. Y'all get it? Sometimes you got to be the, the person that they, you can just be relatable to them if you want them to follow you. Lead by example, that's right. So things will only work if people can see that all of us is doing this, or is it just you calling the orders and we gotta, do, we gotta be the worker bees. People won't follow that kind of stuff. All right, so watch this. He says, uh, we read that part 16, furthermore, I had, uh, furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table. In other words, Nehemiah was somebody who fed other people. Yes, he helped the house of Israel, but he was taking care of other people and he used his influence for good instead of just being a governor. OK, so some of the stuff that God has blessed you with, sometimes he wants you to just be a blessing to somebody else because you you have the ability to be a blessing. Not so everybody can look at you with all googly eyes, but so that you can be in a position where they can they can listen to you. I'm almost done. 17, he says, furthermore, 150 Jews officials ate at my table as well as those who came from some of the surrounding eras, areas. Verse 18, each day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me. And, and every 10 days, an abundant supply of wine and all kinds. In spite of this, watch this, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor. I never demanded this. I could have had more, but I didn't, I didn't pick up the governor's salary. I just wanted to live like everybody else because Nehemiah had this thing about him. He knew that he was in a God-given seat, but he was a still just a regular guy like everybody else. In his mind, he was still a cupbearer trying to make sure that nothing's going to poison the king. In this case, he was a governor trying to make sure, taste the thing to make sure nothing's going to poison the family. It's the same seat, but he had a, a humble walkabout. That's what, that's what caused him to be so powerful. All right. So he said, I never demand the food of the governor because the demands of the people were too heavy. You got to look at your family and you got to ask yourself if what we're asking, if what I'm asking them, is it going to be too heavy for them to do? Can we really do this? If not, let me modify what I can do to make this easier for everybody else. If I'm going to tell my kids to do this, what am I doing to help them to do that? If I want my husband or my wife to listen to me, what am I doing to make it easier? Do I come in the house to be nagging and, and throwing stuff and kicking over tables and then want them to listen to me? Or am I going to come in and, and actually just get down with them. Because you catch more bees with honey, right? Ain't that how you say it? You catch more bees with honey. So you can't come in there expecting to demand anything and expect people to just kind of just fall in line. You have to earn the right to be heard. Because you can be right at what you're saying, but you have not yet earned the right to be heard. So you can tell people to say all day long, this is what you need to do and this is what you need to do. And yes, you're right. But because you haven't earned the right to be heard, they're not going to listen to you. So sometimes it's not good to start that argument at that time. Because all it's going to do is just destroy the house. I hope y'all hearing me. Some fights are not worth it. You may be right. You didn't clean that shower. I know I didn't clean the shower, but it's not time to talk about the shower yet. This guy just came home from a hard day's work. <laughs> but talk about the shower when, when it's peaceful times. Talk about making this when it's a, a, when you when you walk in the house and you see that people are breathing fire. Now is not the time to say you, you, you also didn't do this. That's not the right time. You got to use wisdom if you want people to hear what you got to say. And then a lot of times you have to. I mean, there are some times where you got to get controversy. 
You got to rock the boat in order to have smooth sailing. I get it. Sometimes you got to confront this thing. But you got to make sure you find the right timing for it. Because just because you think about it right now does not mean it's the right time. You got to be wise. And that's what Nehemiah did when he used the swords and he used the, uh, the armor. The Bible talks about that they never took off their armor. And that's profound because the Bible talks about put on the whole armor of God. But he said they never took it off, even when they went to water, eat for water. In other words, when you go to church, a lot of people like to put on their armor. When they come out of church, they take off their armor until next Sunday or next time they meet. Well, you got to get to the point like if you put on your armor, keep it on all the time. They slept in their armor, he says. They woke up with their armor. Yeah, they were probably stanking a little bit, but hey, they had armor on and the enemy did not attack. And you got to get to the point of how serious are you when it comes to this family? I got to keep my armor on. Otherwise, I'm just talking to people. All right. So then he says, and this is my, my prayer all the time. Remember me with favor. Verse 19. Remember me with favor. Oh, my God, for all I have done for these people. In other words, Lord, I'm throwing away these, these music CDs. I don't know if this is right. I'm hurting these people's feelings, but I'm doing this for your glory because I see what's on the other end of this. Lord, help me. I'm, I'm a parent. I may not be doing everything right. I'm doing the best I can. But Lord, remember me with favor as I help these people. I think about that when I look at you all. I be like, Lord, I'm up here. You know, these people be coming to a hotel. They could be going anywhere else. But remember what I've been doing for these people that I did try to study. I did try to put things together and I tried to provide a space for these people to have successful families and and my prayer is don't let me lose my family as I'm helping other people's family because I want the favor too. <laughs> I want you all to have favor, but I'm like, Lord, remember me. It's like the thief on, it's like the, thief on the cross. I've been, I, I'm not perfect. I haven't done everything. But when you come into your kingdom, <laughs> don't forget about me. And sometimes I'd be thinking, Lord, I, I, everything I'm doing and I don't know what he's going to do with this church and everything, but I'd be thinking, everything that I do, remember me, Lord, because <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to lose my inheritance either. Because that's not fun for me to build everybody and I don't have anything. So remember me. And sometimes you got to ask God, remember me, Lord. I tried. I really did try. And it's a sacrifice when you do something for God because you know what God is calling you to do, but you get, you get attacked all along the way. But if God remembers you, you'll make it. You'll make it. So that's, that's my prayer. Lord, let, remember me with favor, oh my God, for all I've done for these people. And we're going to all see this promised land, you all. What verse is that? Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 19. <clears throat> all the stuff you're doing for your family, making sure that they don't watch the wrong stuff and watching their, their kids, what kind of people come over their house and, and who you will let around your house. All of that is so that God can remember you with favor. And you're not wasting your time when you do this. Sometimes it seems hard. Because you're the bad guy in the house and y'all don't let me do anything. Well, you're protecting them from something greater. I tell you all, all the time, me and my mom don't get along. We don't have the perfect relationship, but my mom took me to church. She took me to church. I was exposed to the gospel. You know, and I, uh, you know, we don't hate each other, but we just bump heads a lot because we got kind of the same personality. My point is, that I don't want to have a generational curse with my kids just because me and my mom don't look, have this good relationship. I want to still have a relationship good with my boys. So I ask God, remember me, Lord, because I, I did try and I wasn't religious in this thing. This was my, this was my heart. Y'all hear me? Yeah. It can work. The family can work. Okay, go to my next point. Y'all about to make me choke up over here. <laughs> 
Thank you for listening to Upon the Rock broadcast. If this message has been a blessing, you can help us spread the gospel by sharing this message with your friends. Also, if you're online, please be sure to contact me either through our website at ShakirMinistries.org or through social media. I would love to hear from you. Together, we can build a godly foundation in the lives of people. Until next time, please know that I'm praying for you and I hope to see you on our next broadcast.